Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of Politically Depressed. I'm your host, Eamon McAdam, and in this very first episode, I want to briefly go through why I've decided to make a podcast and what this podcast even is to begin with. So from the title, I think it's pretty obvious that this is going to be a very political podcast, but also a podcast that involves itself a lot with issues of quote-unquote mental health. I don't like the term. I'll definitely talk about it much more later on, especially because it's so much more all-encompassing than what mental health as a kind of exclusive thing suggests. But I'm already getting ahead of myself. I want to make a podcast exploring and talking about why we are all so incredibly depressed. Everybody I know is on antidepressants. Everyone I know is not just in therapy, but is frustrated with their therapist and kind of hitting a wall with mental health discourses and practices. And a big part of that for me is that, you know, I I don't subscribe to this idea that it's just a low levels of serotonin, or that, you know, each individual person has their reasons to be depressed, and it's their childhood and everything. I mean, all these definitely are factors, and I don't discount all this analysis. But I think there's a massive elephant in the room whenever depression is being discussed or anxiety. And that's to do with material conditions. That's to do with politics and economics. And uh, it's not lost on me um, at all, because for me, politics has never been anything that's all that distant. My first confrontation with politics, uh, I grew up in Beirut, and my first experience of politics is the massive car explosion that assassinated the former prime minister, Rafi Hariri, in 2005. I was 11 years old in the playground of my school, and we were playing basketball, and uh, this massive explosion, we all go running inside, and none of us really knew what it was. Uh, there was a theory going around that it was that uh, huge weather balloon, or it was, what would you call it, a hot air balloon that exploded. We were kids. But so, thinking about politics in that sense, as, as like lived experience, and not as something that's just something discussed in cafes and in bars and the like, makes the connection between one's mental health and one's experience of politics much more real. Another really good example is that I have been on antidepressants for three years now, two years, and I started, this is my second time on antidepressants, and I started because at the time I was still in Lebanon and there were Israeli jets flying overhead every day. And it was freaking me out. And this came on the back of the port explosion in 2020. But I'm getting way ahead of myself. I just want to establish that this podcast is going to be talking a lot about mental health, its political implications and causes, and is going to really reflect my own experiences. I've decided to start recording this now because... It's been 80 days of genocide by the Israeli military machine uh, on the people of Gaza, uh, alongside attacks on uh, southern Lebanon with threats of doing to Beirut what they've done to Gaza. It is really fucking with me. The last 80 days have been some of the worst of my life just to experience. It's, It's absolutely impossible to continue to just live one's life, and I don't think we should be at the same time, there is only so much I can do. And reckoning with that incompetence, or that impotence, rather, is something that I struggle with, and I know a lot of people are struggling with. Uh, On top of this, I think the lack of ability to speak about these things, Twitter is a fucking shit show. Uh, Instagram, I mean, aside from just the fact that these are owned by Zionist billionaires, there's also so much censorship, but also it's this anger economy, uh, or this sort of like hate filled, not hate filled, but you know what I mean? It's this algorithm that benefits from the shittiest, the hottest takes, and is not something I want to contribute to anymore. I want this to provide me with an outlet to express and talk about my analysis, my experience, to highlight different things that I think aren't discussed as much I just want this to be a space to talk about how depressed we all are, and the trauma, and everything in between. (sighs) For the last year, but way more in the last 80 days, I have felt like I've been losing myself. 
And making this podcast for me is not just a way of like trying to quote unquote recover or get better, but for the time being is a way of trying to salvage myself. I feel like I have a lot to say and I don't feel like I have a lot of ways of saying it or places to say it. And so ultimately I've been feeling numb. Um, a couple of days ago, something happened to me that hasn't happened in a while. Nothing that intense, but a story happened. In my life in Beirut, stories happen every day. And stories for me are kind of my lifeblood. I thrive on them. I seek them out. I, uh, I sometimes create them. Sometimes I'm just happy to be observing them, you know, kind of neglecting my own needs just to see where a story plays out. But since moving to Vienna in the last couple of years, I haven't been experiencing that many stories. Stories don't happen that often. They're, the streets aren't as filled. People are just generally colder. They keep to themselves. And so I'm kind of deprived of these stories. But one did occur to me a couple of days ago. And I'd like to share that story because I think actually it's a pretty good one to describe where I'm at emotionally. But also maybe give you a bit of flavor of some of the stories to come because I do love telling these stories. So this was a couple of days ago, and I'm heading out with a friend who came to visit for the last few days, and we're taking out a small bag of trash, and we're going to go head out to the Arab market. But when I get to the first floor, I notice that the ground floor apartment, the door's open and the person's talking, and this is my 85-year-old neighbor, Helga, who, as the name suggests is a very cold and bitter and hateful German woman. And, <laughs> I mean, to be fair, she hasn't been having some health issues lately, and my partner actually has been kind of being very neighborly and, and helpful. But I, I just didn't want to sort of get involved in whatever's happening, so I kind of told my friend, like, let's go back upstairs, I want to avoid this. My friend, who's, again, a lot like me, was like, no, no, I want to... See I want to see who this famous Helga, what this famous Helga looks like. So he takes the trash bag and he continues downstairs. And he goes to the backyard, the, the hof as it's called, to throw out the trash. And I just sort of stay there. But then I hear uh, Helga say something like, oh, no, no, Ginny, Ginny, her cat. And so it becomes obvious that the cat ran out. And I'm on the first floor. I start noticing that, I, oh my god, they're going to run up to me. So I run up to the second floor. But then as I get there, I turn around and the cat's just right there. And I kind of feel really guilty. So I pick up the cat. I go downstairs. I give her the cat. And the very first thing she tells me, she looks at me. I haven't seen this woman in like four months. But she looks like she's aged five years. She's been in and out of hospital. And um yeah... And she didn't recognize me. She asked me, are you Amon? And I'm like, yeah. And she, she grabs me and she's like, come with me. And she drags me into my, the, her apartment. Uh, I only catch a glimpse of my friend who was there, but I, I couldn't say anything. And she closed the door. She takes me into her kitchen and she starts talking to me about her washing machine. And I didn't quite understand. I mean, she's speaking German and my German is not where it should be, but that's beside the point. But she just kept saying something about the washing machine is not working and she needs it to work. And I really wasn't picking up. And I told her, oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how to help you. I, I, you know, I, you need to call like a repairman, a repair person. And I apologize. And then she drags me into her bedroom and points to her TV. She's like, come help me with this other thing. And the signal is not working. And she asks me if she can, I can help her. And she, as I'm trying to figure it out, I pick up the remote. She starts telling me about how tired she's been and how sad she is and how lonely she is and how she's thanking me for taking care of the cat while she was in the hospital. And she kind of starts to well up. And it was, it was a bit upsetting, you know, seeing an old lady cry. Um, I'm trying to fix the TV. And I managed to get it to kind of, it just wasn't plugged in, the TV box. And I plug it in. And as soon as the signal changes... She grabs my hand and she screams. And then she just starts crying. Thank you so much. You have no idea how much you've helped me. And I just can't so appreciative. And 
And the signal then, you know, the TV picks up and it just starts blasting out loud. Like it was a started, it was like a commercial for the Barbie movie. And, you know, she's an old lady. So she's like got the the volume up super high. Anyway, uh, she doesn't stop talking. She keeps talking to me. But the TV is there and I can't lower the volume. I don't know how. And um, she starts telling me about these things. And she's talking about these two sons. At this point, she's speaking English. She does not speak English. But again, she keeps forgetting that I don't speak German. But she's telling me that a reason that she needed the washing machine to work is because tomorrow she's going to meet with her estranged son who, like, backstory, they haven't seen each other in 30 years. It's crazy. Very Austrian. Like, that shit would just... It's impossible in Lebanon. She found out, like, a few months ago that he's still in Vienna. You know? Like, for a mother to not see her child for 30 years and he's still in the same city? Impossible. Impossible for it to happen in Lebanon. And it just... It blows my mind that that, that's a real story. But either way, um, she thanks me, she grabs my hand, and we're just sort of, like, holding hands, and she's looking into my eyes, and she looks super upset and sad and old. And I hate to say it. I know this makes me seem like a really despicable person, but I just couldn't feel anything. I just felt numb. I've been crying on and off for, like, the last 80 days, and my heart feels so full. And, you know, this is new, what's happening in Gaza, as in the aerial bombardment, the, the, the genocide. Um, for this last, like, few years, it's just been one thing after another coming from my region and I just feel like numb and I don't want to uh, empathy is something for me that's one of the most important values so um, I don't know it kind of hurts it's really upsetting that I've come to this point where the situation you know I'm in this place and I just can't feel anything uh, I'm happy to have helped but you know anyway I tell her if you ever need anything let me know and uh she sees me off I see my friend and we go and you know I tell him about what had happened and uh he was a bit annoyed because he was like why did you go and you know you left me for 10 minutes and 15 minutes and then I heard you watching tv together I found that really funny but either way I like that story it's <laughs> it's exactly the stories that I like it's useless it's pointless it's Stuff happens. It's, you know, it doesn't happen every day. I mean, in Beirut, it would happen every day. But you know what I mean? It's unique and strange and filled with metaphors and themes. But ultimately, it's absurd and it doesn't matter. And I didn't really learn anything. I mean, I guess in this case, I did learn something. All that to say, I hope through this podcast that I can meet other people and in some way break this numbness because I wasn't always like this. And I don't like it. I don't like being numb. I, I miss feeling and whatever, the goods and the bads. I mean, now it's just bad and meh. And occasionally there's like an up. But like that up gets expended in like an hour or two. So I think that's as close as I can summarize it. I think in terms of the what, this is obviously going to be a blog format. Um, I'm going to be doing most of the talking. Uh, but I also hope eventually to be getting some interviews. Uh, there's a lot of people that I have these discussions with. I think I know a lot of very interesting, very cool, lefty, active, whatever people that are also super mega fucking depressed. And it always feels frivolous when you're in these situations and in these contexts to be talking about depression and anxiety when there's like mass starvation and violence and oppression. But I feel like it only does more harm not to talk about it because it just compounds and we ultimately become less able to confront those issues and to be active and to do what we can if we're not you know it kind of reminds me of one of these things my mother says over and over again and i never interrupt her every time she tells me sometimes she's forgotten that she's told me it a hundred times i just let her because i, I love hearing it every time uh it's kind of one of one of her wisdoms what do they say in a plane when, you know, loss of cabin pressure and the masks come down? You know, you got to put on your own mask before you help someone else. Because, yeah, you need to take care of yourself to be able to take care of someone else. And uh, 
Yeah, I kind of really value that, and I appreciate it every time she tells me. <sighs> and that's the other point. Stories. This podcast is going to be full of stories. I like telling stories. I'm a trained screenwriter, um, <laughs> and I kind of got into that for a reason, but... I do find that I just, I, I don't know, I notice things, I talk about things, I like telling them in fun ways, and and I enjoy telling stories that I think are, like, thematically rich and, and you know, obviously political in some ways. And, and I feel like I used to experience them so much in Beirut, and part of the plan of me leaving Beirut, and part of the ways that I had planned to kind of not go insane, is that I think of my time in Beirut as having collected a bunch of stories, and not able to write them down because they just kept happening every day and mixed with everything else. But so the plan was for me that when I leave, that I would be in a place where I could do something with those stories, that I could write them, that I could make something of them. Uh, and that way, being so far away from those stories, you know, I could get closer to them again. So, yeah, I, I envision this to be a kind of a fun place to talk about dark things, uh, empathetically, of course. And I hope you enjoy this, and uh, I look forward to hearing any and all responses. I, I'm, I'm kind of excited. It's one of the only things that's gotten me excited in the last couple of years. So I hope you're excited by this, too, and uh, I'll see you in the next episode.